Now, from Wish TV, your local news source, this is All Indiana Politics. And good Sunday morning. Welcome to another edition of All Indiana Politics. I'm Phil Sanchez. We're now one month into this year's legislative session. Lawmakers will release their initial budget numbers in days, and we're still watching for action on property tax relief. Here's what Indiana's House leaders had to say. Starting to become more busy. Obviously, we've seen uh, committee meetings, uh, lots of bills coming through. We're going to have approximately 40 on the calendar for next week, and uh, we're excited about our agenda bills. 1005 went through with by, strong bipartisan support, an issue I care a lot about. Uh, is how we increase the housing stock in our state and working with our local and, and uh, uh, partners on that. I'm sure you're going to ask me about 1008 and, uh, you know, Representative Manning and, and our team is working with NPERS and, and you know, we'll, we'll find the right, right landing spot. You're going to see that bill next week and uh, uh, as we continue conversations, but we're going to get that bill across the finish line. And then obviously, you know, it's hard to believe, but next week we'll roll out the House Republican budget. We look forward to that. Um, Megan, Chairman Thompson, the committee has done really good work. They've got some final decisions to make, and we look forward to uh, presenting it next week. You'll see an amendment that, that tightens up some language that I think, you know, uh, clarifies what the intent is, which is to maximize returns without getting into political and social issues. And so, you know, we feel good that, you know, we've had good conversations in the last couple of days, more today and I'm sure more tomorrow. But, you know, we want we want to maximize returns, too, is, is uh, and uh, we'll get there. How closely do you anticipate the House Republican budget tracking with what the governor proposed, especially when it comes to some of the big ticket items like education, health, yeah. textbook fees? Pretty closely. I mean, you know, I think we'll, we've always had a good partnership with Governor Holcomb. And, uh, you know, look, he, uh, he listed a huge list of priorities this year. And, uh, uh, you know, I think we'll accomplish many of those. And uh, we'll have a few maybe different priorities, but that's OK. I mean, the process works. He presents his budget. We present ours. I'm sure our Senate colleagues will have some ideas, too, then we'll mesh it up at the end. I've been pretty clear, I think, in the past that I'm fine with it being noted. Uh, if you want to identify who your political party is and, and that's on the ballot, I'm fine with that. Uh, you know, I think we're going to have an interesting caucus conversation over the next week uh, about where we end up on this bill. We've got members all across the spectrum on this. Uh, Totally against wanting to make in local control. We're gonna have to work with the clerks to figure out what's what's possible and what isn't. So, like, you know, this is one of those bills that you know it doesn't split along party lines. It's, I think it's a it, it, it depends on your community and those types of things. I, I think Chairman Wesco and Representative Prescott are trying to find a way to provide more local options uh, to it, and we'll see where we end up. I, I you know, I, like, but I've said, I've been pretty clear through the last few years that I, if somebody wants to declare their party affiliation, I think you should be able to do it on a, on a, on a ballot. You know, Representative uh, Thompson is, uh, Chairman Thompson is working through uh, some issues for 2024 uh, in, in one of his House bills. And, uh, and you know, the, we, we've had lots of conversations with DLGF. Uh, and, you know, the biggest challenge we have is, like, literally people are going to get their property tax bills in the next week, uh, or excuse me, in the next month. I think actually April 10th is the last day. Uh, they can be in somebody's mailbox. So, uh, you know, we're trying to work through that with DLGF for as many options as possible. We, you know, obviously for, for somebody that's always believed in tax relief, we want to look to find tax relief in some way or another, whether it's on property tax or something else. Is that possible for this That's going to be the brand, that's the challenge that we're facing right now, to be honest with you. Uh, again, I'm a guy who believes in tax relief, and we've, we've sent out multiple taxpayer refunds, we've cut in rates, I think, you know, we need to provide some tax relief. It may not be specifically on that, but for other issues. Very pleased with that with regards to uh, Representative Mowat's House Bill 1157, creating new residential housing programs in Marion County. Uh, Representative Bauer mentioned that last week in her House Bill 1219 with regards to the funding for um, uh, PFAS and House Bill 1449, authored by Representative Harris uh, with regards to the 21st Century Scholar Program, makes, trying to get more uh, kids automatically registered. It sounds like it's running into trouble. It's been um, bouncing around ways and means, excuse me, then off the calendar. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. Obviously, I think we're trying to, well, I think what I've seen anyway from the bill that Republicans are trying to do is sort of answer some of these cultural war issues that they're trying to, uh, that they've been uh, questioned about. And so they're putting this, the, their answers into this uh, bill. And um, it's obviously going to cost uh, a lot of money. So there's some issues there I think we're running into. I'm not sure what kind of amendments are actually going to help uh, lower the 
six to seven billion dollar loss that they're looking at, but we'll see. To that point, more broadly, before this session and when the session began, you said you wanted to see fewer of these social issues come up. We've got the ESG legislation. We've got several bills uh, deal with transgender issues. Do you see those issues raising their heads again the way they did last session? It, it looks like it. I mean, in uh, um, what I've seen uh, this week, um, and, and the idea was, or the, my concerns going into, look, this is a budget year. We have higher priorities that we should be focusing on with regards to fully funding a public education, pre-K, a big health care initiative. Uh, so we have a lot more important things to work on than some of these things that I think that are starting to come up uh, right, around, right around Valentine's Day. <laughs> and um, so we'll see, we'll see where they go. But um, it sounds like they're, they're, you know, we had 40 bills, that, committee reports that were adopted today that will be on second reading. I haven't chance to look at all of them, um, but I, I know it sounds like some of them are kind of getting into that culture war um, uh, lane, which I was hoping that we could avoid. It could be a little difficult, as you said, could it, as you mentioned, this is going to be for next year, um, unless there's some sort of, um, uh, you know, it can, be, it can be hard, unless there's a, I was thinking a homestead credit or something like that. We'll see. We'll kind of work through that. Um, I know our Ways and Means folks recognize the issue of the property values and, and taxes going up, so we'll see what, what we can do on that, but it's going to be kind of difficult. All right, coming up next, the top state lawmaker gets an up-close view of the biggest political event of the year. Welcome back. Imagine getting invited to the State of the Union by someone who's not a member of your own political party. That's exactly what happened to Indiana's House Minority Leader. News 8 government reporter Garrett Burquist found out what it's really like to attend the biggest political speech of the year. Every member of the U.S. House gets to bring one special guest to State of the Union. And for House Minority Leader Phil Giaquinta, that invitation came from an old colleague. Even though they're from opposing parties, Giaquinta worked with now Congressman Jim Banks when Banks was in the State Senate. He called me um, and uh, uh, offered me the opportunity to go. And, you know, I'm uh, one that has always respected the institution and, and these type of events with the speeches. And, um, and I thought, you know, what really kind of a once in a lifetime once in a lifetime opportunity to go. Both parties held receptions ahead of the speech. Giaquinta went to both and ran into Transportation Secretary and former South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg, among others. Which was really uh, fun to see him again uh, and just, uh, you know, always given a pitch to for, you know, funding for Indiana <laughs> while I'm out there making a business trip. So. By 8 o'clock, it was time to get to his seat. It was packed. I mean, it, I don't know how many people it hold, but we were trying, in fact, the person next to me, we were trying to guess maybe a thousand, something like that. But again, as I said, um, there's just a lot of anticipation in the air of what, of what the, uh, the president was going to say. Giaquinta says there actually was a lot of bipartisan standing applause. He particularly noted President Joe Biden's comments about semiconductor manufacturing. Indiana Senator Todd Young played a key role in passing that legislation. Giaquinta says attending State of the Union is something he'll never forget. It's an opportunity that I, I never really thought I would have the opportunity to do. Um, and so um, I was uh, glad to do it. And it, it's for someone like me who, uh, you know, my dad served in the legislature um, and then I followed him in his seat. So we have this uh, respect for the institution and the process. Giaquinta says if you're ever invited to be someone's special guest at State of the Union, take a couple of days and make a trip out of it. He says make sure you get out and explore D.C. At the State House, Garrett Bergquist, Wish TV, wishtv.com, and follow us on Facebook. All right, coming up, balloons, documents, and disciplinary action. Our panel delves into this week's top headlines. All right, welcome back to All Indiana Politics as we welcome back two members of Indiana's best political team, Democrat Arielle Brandy and Republican Whitley Yates. Ladies, good to see you. Let's begin with the uproar over the Chinese spy balloon. The State Department, as you know, says the balloon had sophisticated signals intelligence uh, gathering capabilities. And we now know that the Chinese government has sent many such balloons to the Western Hemisphere. Now, Arielle, I'll start with you on this one. Should the Biden administration have acted sooner such as before the balloon reached the United States? I mean, I understand some of the concerns that, you know, the Biden administration had over making sure that before they shot this down, that it was in a place in which no, you know, human or civilian lives were going to be harmed. But I do think that it is also too a misstep on our behalf to not have done something sooner. I mean, to let something like that enter 
uh, our country's hemisphere. I mean, it has concerns for me as someone who is a Democrat. Um, I think we need to be more on top of things like this, especially when we're seeing more um, intrusive um, measures happening upon our data, being hacked, things like that. We know that this is not uncommon, but I do think that um, we had to and should have moved a little mm -hmm. bit swiftly on this effort. Um, that's something that definitely concerns me. Whitley, several of these balloons reportedly came near the U.S. during the Trump administration. Does the former president bear any responsibility for, for things getting to this point? Yeah, I don't know, because if he didn't know that these balloons came near and the fact that this information was found out in a different administration, it's hard to say. But one thing that I will say is we have to be more vigilant as a country, making sure we're protecting our national security and the sovereignty of our country. So responding to the spy balloon, I, I don't even like calling it the spy balloon, but responding to anything that's in our aircraft that is not sent from us, it's supposed to be there. It is incumbent upon any administration, any leader of this country to take swift action to protect us here. Yeah. In other news, federal authorities were back at the former Vice President Mike Pence's home to search for more classified documents here in, in Indiana. Uh, they found some as well on Friday. Meanwhile, Pence is expected to visit Iowa next week. Whitley, could this undermine a potential 2024 bid for the presidency? Um, you know what I'm going to say? If it doesn't undermine President Biden being able to run again, I don't think it's going to undermine, undermine Mike Pence uh, trying to run for president or any of his political aspirations. I think what we've seen from President Trump, uh, former President Trump, to President Biden, to now Vice President Pence, is that we have to take the security of these documents very seriously in each and every case and making sure that we get classified information away from the leaders who were once in power or leaders who don't have access or shouldn't have access to that information is a top priority. Ariel, should Pence face any disciplinary action over the documents? I mean, if we're going to apply it to everyone thus far, then I think so. I think the issue we run into, like Whitney mentioned, is like we have to do better at making sure that these classified documents do not make it outside of the walls in which they're supposed to be in. I know that it's supposedly pretty common that this has happened, but unfortunately for me, I mean, it just has to stop, full stop. Now, we did see a difference in how, you know, Trump handled this investigation and the having these documents versus how Biden administration went about it. Now, while there are stark differences between the two, at the end of the day, it still shouldn't have happened. And so I think what we have to remember is that these documents are classified. They need to stay where they're supposed to. And we have to do better going forward, whether you are running for a public office, trying to be in the highest office of the land, or you currently hold it, we have to make sure that we're holding each other accountable and making sure that across the board that we are conducting these investigations and making sure that it does not happen again. Speaking it can't happen again. Right. Speaking of 2024, ladies, former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley expected to launch her presidential bid on Wednesday. Ariel, uh, how worried should Democrats be if Haley is the nominee? I don't think that we have to be worried. I think at the end of the day, DeSantis is the one that needs to be worried at this point on the GOP side. I mean, we saw that Nikki Haley had announced, you know, a while ago that if Trump was going to run, that she wasn't going to put her hat in the ring, but she has decided to move forward with it. I don't think that it's a concern for Democrats. I mean, right now, we just saw that Biden gave a really strong state of the union, and I have full confidence that if he decides to run in 2024, which he has said that he would, um, I think that we are in a good spot, and I don't see there, there being any competition in that way. Whitley, similar question to you. How do you gauge Haley's primary chances, especially against former President Donald Trump and potentially Pence even? Yeah, you know what, Nikki Haley, she's a strong, influential leader. Um, she was governor, she's been ambassador to the United Nations, and I think what that really stands for is freedom and leadership both at home and abroad. And so I do think um, being a female challenger on the Republican side of things that she presents a viable option. Now, when it comes to Trump and DeSantis, I don't know where we're going to be. I'm still waiting to see if DeSantis has actually put his name in the ring or if all we're doing is cannon fodder each and every day, assuming that he is. Um, so right now, we know it's between uh, former President Donald Trump and Nikki Haley. I want to shift the conversation to the State House now. A House committee approved a bill to prevent child services from removing a child solely because their parents don't provide gender transition treatment or affirm their identity if they are transgender. Whitley, advocates for LGBTQ youth say that almost always accompanies other forms of abuse or neglect. So why cut off a potential escape route for these kids? 
I think the bill affirms the rights and the responsibilities of parents to raise their children in a manner that they see fit. It does absolutely nothing from, from preventing DCS from ensuring that the children are safe and protected. The truth is when a child is no longer a child, then they can make their own decisions. But until then, we allow the parents to make the decisions for them. So if a child is in danger or there is some type of physical abuse or emotional abuse happening to that child, then I think DCS has the ability to be able to step in in accordance with the law. Ariel, shouldn't there be a, a limit to when the state can take someone's child away, in your opinion? I mean, I think right now what we're seeing is that the GOP is running this continuous attacks against the LGBTQ community and more specifically our trans youth. This is not the first time that we've seen an onslaught of legislation coming up like this, but this more specifically is harmful because it does put trans youth in a position in which they could have continued abuse happening in their household. We have to hold people accountable for that. So providing, not providing the opportunity for that to be stopped and not having DCS, you know, come in and you know, to be able to provide our youth, our trans youth with the resources that they need is concerning to me. We know that the LGBTQ community is under attack and has been under attack specifically in the state of Indiana. So I think by providing this even more scrutinized lens for trans youth really, for me, makes it harmful, not only for that community, but for all children that are put into this system. Are we going to pick and choose and put an asterisk aside which children we decide to save in the state of Indiana? I would hope not. I hope that we're going to move forward in making sure that we're an inclusive state. And that means including trans youth in that process. Whitley, I'll let you respond to that. Yeah, I don't think that this bill does anything that puts trans youth in a position to be objectified or abused. And the truth of the matter is, when I tell my child no, the answer is no. And if she was able to call DCS on me because she wanted to go outside in a mini skirt when it's snowing outside and I said no, and they told me that I was then abusing my child, we would have problems. In this same case, if the parents don't agree that the child should be getting any type of, of transgender surgeries or any, any type of that, um, medical practice why why is them saying no then all of a sudden they're being abusive or this is physical or we need to remove the child let's think about this in terms of all situations and not just this one Ariel, i'll let you respond to final word on this topic at the end of the day i just want to see the gop stop putting these harmful attacks on the lgbtq community it feels like time and time again every single general session we see this happen at what point are we just going to stop and move forward at making sure that this state is inclusive? We need to be protecting all Hoosiers, and that means LGBTQ Hoosiers and more specifically our trans youth. Attorney General Todd Rukita, ladies, reportedly under investigation from the Indiana Disciplinary Commission. This comes amid his investigation into abortion doctor Caitlin Bernard. Ariel, uh, doesn't Rukita have the right to ensure doctors follow Indiana's rules and regulations? Uh, time and time again, Todd Rakita in the situation where he's continuously being investigated for ethical concerns. I mean, we saw the attacks that he specifically had on Dr. Caitlin Bernard and the story around the 10 year old coming to the state of Indiana to receive a legal abortion um, in, in providing medical care. I mean, at what point I now have the question for Whitley, is the GOP going to hold Todd Rakita accountable for Go these ahead, attacks? Go ahead, Whitley, respond quickly. And sticks and stones may break his bones, but so far, none of the investigations have hurt him. And that's the problem. The problem is people are attacking Todd Rokita consistently, and the investigations haven't stuck. In this case, he announced that he was going to be investigating this doctor. He eventually dropped the suit and didn't investigate the doctor. And I think that this is just a witch hunt into Todd Rokita. Okay. But if he has had an ethical issue, I do believe that the court of law should prevail. But if he hasn't, I think it's water under the bridge. We'll, we'll, see what, we'll see what happens there. We'll see what happens there. On a lighter note, it's Super Bowl Sunday. I want to get your picks, ladies. Ariel, uh, hey, who? Is this <laughs> I'm looking forward to the great food that we are going to have for the Super Bowl party. I don't particularly have a pick when it comes okay. to a team. So I'm Whitley? looking forward to the Rihanna Eagles concert. Eagles all day, baby. Eagles all day. Oh, come on. I say go Chiefs. All day. All right, ladies, enjoy the Super Bowl. We'll talk soon. Thank you. We'll be right back. All right, thank you for joining us for All Indiana Politics. We'll be back here next Sunday morning at 930. You can also find our brand new All Indiana Politics podcast. It's part of the All Indiana Podcast Network over at wishtv.com. Enjoy the Super Bowl and have a great rest of your weekend.